I want to start out this morning, and this morning, I, I know I say this often, but this, this message is a little bit different in that it's more of, as we've been going verse by verse through the entire book of Nehemiah, we get to Nehemiah 11, there's just a pile of names. How many read ahead just to kind of see what was coming up in Nehemiah 11? Anybody? A uh, handful of you, okay. So it's kind of funny because when you get to one of these chapters, like you have, we've had two or three chapters like this where it's just a ton of names. And initially in your heart, you want, in your mind, you're like, what in the world are you going to get a message out of this? There's always a message. If it was important to God, enough to God to put it in there, there, it's important to us to learn from it, and he's got something for us to learn from it. And, uh, but I also know that even though it's a shorter message and it's kind of a lot of introduction this morning uh, and a little bit of uh, meat towards the end, um, if I could just say it, I know that there are a lot of you going through some struggles right now. I know a lot of you are going through physical issues, you're fighting with health. Some of you are fighting in relationships with your children, with your coworkers. I, I've heard so many people in the last couple of weeks say, man, life has just been really, really tough of late. A- anybody feeling that kind of weight, that pressure? Yeah, all over the place. And so I don't know about you, and I, I, I know I'm the pastor so I'm supposed to have it all together, right? I mean, because you, you cut me, I don't bleed red like you. So I'm just, it's a superhuman difference. It's purplish. No, I was kidding. But, you know, we all struggle, right? We all go through things. And I tell you this, I, I said, man, if we can get through COVID, we can get through anything. It's just couldn't because COVID just drove me nuts. Well, then you end up having a heart surgery. And that was like, okay, I get through this heart surgery. And then, then we'll be fine. And then I got an infection. Then you get through the infection. You know, everything's going to be fine. Then you get bacterial infection, you know, in your intestines. And it's like, oh, it's going to be fine. It's just like, what gives, right? What gives? Some of you have been through some of this stuff. And I feel like every time we go through one of these things, it's a choice. And remember, with every choice, there are consequences to those choices. We can pretend like there's no big big deal, or we can say, okay, Lord, I'm truly giving it to you. Or we can try to handle it ourselves and... All those choices have consequences. But one thing I do know is that all these things that come, they can either be a distraction or they can be something that God uses in our life to draw us closer to him and make us more like him, right? Um, and that's, those are the choices. Either fight it and kick against it and get angry and rebellious and mad over it, or you can say, God, I surrender it. I give it to you. Use it to make me more like your son, right? And uh, there's things that I wouldn't pick. I, I would have never picked to go through a heart surgery. I would have never picked to have infections. I wouldn't choose those things. And they're not on my bucket list. <laughs> Got that one done. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you know, right? We don't choose those things. God chooses those things for us at times. And, uh, and if he allows it, he's got a reason for allowing it, right? He's got a reason. And do we trust him that he knows what he's doing? And I know that's something I got. I got to. I got to come to grips with sometimes. You know, God, are you, are you sure about this? Because I'm not. <laughs> and uh, so I think a lot of it comes down to our is our daily surrender. Our daily surrender, sometimes hourly. Because I know that there's been times in my life where I said, in the moment, I wanted to shoot somebody, at least slap them, if nothing else. And I'm like, okay, once again. We got to take a step back, take a breath. Remember, we saw that Nehemiah in one of those circumstances, he had to just know when to step back and say, Lord, you got this one. Because in my flesh, I want to deal with it, right? I'm going to deal with it. And that probably would have been the wrong choice and resulted in a whole set of consequences that you wouldn't want. But there are also times when we say, Lord, thank you for taking care of it. So can we do this this morning? Can we just take a minute and... I don't care where you're at in that auditorium. We don't do this a lot. I mean, we pray a lot. But what I would want for us to do is just take two minutes and just, number one, talk to God this morning. Can we do that? Just right there where you're at, just take a moment and talk with God. And here's what I want us to have the conversation about. Lord, work in my life. Show yourself strong. Reveal any areas of sinfulness I need to deal with. 
Lord, if there's some areas I'm not trusting you, Lord, reveal those so I can start trusting you and give me the faith to trust you. And invite the Holy Spirit into the midst of everything that's happening in your life. So let's just take two minutes right there where you're at. Pray with your spouse. Pray with whoever's next to you. I don't care. But let's just take a moment and pray, and then I'll close us if we could. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. As you're praying, maybe there's areas of sinfulness that you need to repent of. As you are praying, maybe there is a circumstance with some relationships. A coworker, a friend, a neighbor, a child. Ask God to work through that. As you are praying, think of areas of thankfulness gratitude that you have not expressed your appreciation for to God he is such a good God a great God a loving God he protects and provides he gives mercy and grace forgiveness long suffering every day when was the last time you thanked him for it as you are praying which unsaved friends relatives neighbors co-workers do you need to ask Jesus to draw to himself? What names come to your mind? Probably most importantly above all those things, Lord, work in my heart this morning. Remove any distractions. Anything that would hinder me from hearing you, Lord, remove it. Lord Jesus, we thank you for each and every one that's here today. As we've prayed already this morning, Lord, we continue to pray. Continue to do a work in our lives, Lord, starting with mine. God, you said if we regard iniquity in our heart, you'll not hear us. So, God, I come before you and I repent of anything, Lord. I don't know of anything specifically, Lord, but even as the psalmist prayed, search me and try me and know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to the way of everlasting. Lord, I pray you cleanse my heart. Forgive me of any sin, Lord, whether I know of it or not. Cleanse my heart. I want there to be no reason why you wouldn't answer, why you wouldn't hear. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in our midst this morning. I pray, God, that your will would be accomplished and not our own. Lord, all these areas that people are struggling with, Lord, whether it be health or relationships or financial or whatever it may be, Lord, I know that there are many feeling the pressures of living in this world. And I pray, dear God, that you would be real to them, that you would draw near to them. May they sense your presence. May you show them hope as you reveal yourself and your love to them. God, I pray for answered prayer this morning. Even now, Father, would you answer prayer? And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory for the Lord. You alone are worthy. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 11, as we continue in our study of Nehemiah. As I said already, it's kind of a shorter message, a lot of introduction, just a little bit of meat. This is kind of one of those weird chapters, you know, and you have them from time to time as we're going through books of the Bible. I can remember as a little boy the adventures of starting new clubs. Any of you guys ever do that when you were a kid? 
There you go. There's about four honest ones of you guys. We are always starting new clubs. Um, I remember starting a club when all my cousins would get together at Thanksgiving uh, or Christmas. I remember starting a club out in the woods with my elementary friends after school. I remember starting a club with a few friends as we were trying to build a tree fort in, the, in upper elementary. Uh, I remember starting clubs so many times. Um, of course, they were all short-lived and often only lasted a few days to a few weeks before everyone either forgot about it or we moved on to the next great adventure. Uh, growing up in where I did in Minnesota, a land of 10,000 lakes, there was water everywhere, there was woods everywhere, and uh, we were always trying to do something in the woods. We were out running around. I, you know, we never sat around. with. I mean, I had some video games, but I never played them. We were like in the woods running around and so forth. And we were always starting some form of club. Some things I remember about each of the clubs we started, though, were things like no outsiders because this is a private club just for us. Uh, I remember things like uh, there's no telling where we're going to meet because it's secret. Anybody have those rules? You couldn't tell anybody. You, they, they can't know about it. And, of course, no adults because this is for us, so adults can't be there. And, of course, the most important one is a little kid, no Guys, help me out. Girls, no girls allowed, right? So I remember making up all these rules, but without even realizing it, we were doing several things that were instinctive and natural, even as little kids. We were doing something that was both instinctive and natural. We were laying a foundation of government, right? Uh, we were coming up with rules and regulations as silly and crazy and ludicrous as they were, they were the rules of the club. Without even realizing it, we were laying a foundation, right? We immediately laid out the rules of membership, who the leader or leaders were that would be in charge of uh, what we would do and when we would get together and so forth. Now, another certainty it was also evident as we were forming these clubs as kids which probably led to the demise of every club or group that we ever started. Abuse of authority. The thoughts of was what was fair or not fair would often arise sooner than later. Or the question of why does so-and-so get to make up all the rules? Anybody ever have that one? I mean, because, well, I'm older or I'm better or I've done this before or I'm bigger than you. Well, why is that fair? How does so-and-so get to make up all the rules? Eventually, most of us would either take our marbles, so to speak, and go home until we all got together the next day to form a different club, right? Um, the clubs were always started with the best of intentions and with great expectations. Now, as kids, we had no idea where we were going with it. It just was cool in the moment. I mean, when we built a tree fort, we didn't know what it was going to look like. We just thought it was going to be awesome. We really never had the wood we needed. We never really never had the supplies we fully needed, but it was going to be cool, though. But the excitement and a willingness to do whatever was needed, whether it was to go get that wood to build, whether it was to go find rope to tie everything together or to lift things up into the tree, whether it was your job to gather the snacks and you know steal some stuff out of the pantry at home and bring it over to the fort, seems so much like politics today, doesn't it? Most candidates start out with the best of intentions, a willingness to do whatever it takes to accomplish the goal at hand, but it seems like it doesn't take long before those things seemingly go out the window. How many times can we look at back over the years of politics and find, man, they started off so good. They had the best of intentions. They started with an idea and an aspiration of helping so many people. But all of a sudden, all that just goes out the window. And it's each, man, each man for himself, right? Nehemiah 11 presents to us a picture of forming that new society. One that is stronger, better, and more secure. So as Nehemiah took inventory of the population, remember back in, I think it was Nehemiah chapter 7, he took a census? And I'm still baffled by this. I'm still truly baffled by this. We talk about a country having walls for security and protection. We're talking about 
not saying no to outsiders coming in, but to come in through the door, right? Um, you have a door on your house. And you have a deadbolt on that door more than likely. Now, some of you use it more than others. I mean, most of the time, is unlocked half the time. Car doors are unlocked half the time. But the reality is, the door is there for what? Protection and security and to keep people who don't need to be in there out, right? Especially at certain hours of the day, in the night, right? Most of us would welcome people if we knew they had a need, they needed help. But we ask them to come in through the door, not through the window on the side of the house. If you need some help financially, we ask that you not break into the back window and steal something and sell it to get that help, right? We want them to come through the door. So it's amazing. As I said before, I've been to 12 countries. My handprint, as I put it down on that scanner, digitally scans the fingerprints in my hand. It's on the national or international database. Every country of Africa I go into, they know when I'm there, and they know when I leave. Why? I had to report them. If I were to get in there somehow without doing that, there's a problem. They want to know how I got in there without going through the process. They'd want to know how I got out or got to this place of coming out without me, you know, being there for a period of time without them knowing that I was there. It's for protection, it's for safety. And way back in Nehemiah 7, you saw that Nehemiah took a census and he compared the names of those that were there then with those that were there 90 years earlier. What were the common names then versus now? He says, I want to know who's legitimate and who's not. As they built the wall for security. See, this whole idea of building a wall and knowing who's inside those walls is nothing new. I mean, this started way back when. Isn't that amazing? This is nothing new under the sun. This is what God had established and put in the heart of Nehemiah to accomplish. So now we find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 11 where the wall is done. Things have become status quo. Eh, that was yesterday's news. That was last week's excitement. We're all just here now. And remember how we saw in Nehemiah chapter 9 and 10 that they had begun to drift away from what God's standard was. And so last week we saw in Nehemiah chapter 10 is that they made a covenant. And this covenant included several things. They were going to return to the God that they knew loved them and cared for them. They made a covenant to walk in obedience, to follow the statutes and ordinance, to implement the laws and to live by them. And the last thing they did is they made a covenant to give to the storehouses of God, to take care of God's house. They were not flippant about it. They made this commitment, they put the seal upon it, and they were willing to live by it. And now we come into chapter 11, and there's all these names, because Nehemiah realized something that they had to address. Something you wouldn't probably think about. And we're not going to read through the entire chapter, because there's a bunch, a bunch of names that I can't pronounce. I'm glad my parents chose an easy name like Ken. Um... But in Nehemiah chapter 11, I do want to read verses 1 and 2. So, first of all, as Nehemiah took inventory of the population, he noticed something was wrong. Most of the people did not live within the city limits, but around the surrounding countrysides and smaller villages. Keep that in mind as we come into Nehemiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It says, And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots, to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. You say, well, what's the big deal here? Well, Nehemiah realized that the, there's a problem here. Yes, we repaired the walls. Yes, we had come together to do that. Yes, things were better than they were because no longer are there gaping holes. No longer is there a burnt foundation. 
We are far better than we were. We're not setting targets anymore. But in the big picture, we're not as strong as we need to be just yet. Why? It's like we got this great big city, entirely strong walls, but not very many people inside. We don't have enough people living inside the walls to truly be able to protect ourselves. And so Nehemiah gathers the people again. And he says, we need to fix this. We need to address this. And so chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 addresses the issue. So in the event of an attack, those living outside the walls would likely have their fields plundered. They might have their houses you know, destroyed. But without little doubt, they would at least be able to escape to the hills, escape to the countryside, and, and get away from being killed and slaughtered. They could get away. But that's not the case for those inside the walls, because once you're inside the walls, you're inside the walls trapped. The gate is shut. They get inside. You have nowhere to run. You have nowhere to hide. Um, so he wanted the people who lived outside the walls to move inside the walls. And this wouldn't necessarily be an easy move for those who were willing to come in. It wasn't going to make everything easier. Well, now I used to have to work in the fields out there, but now I'm going to come inside where everything is. It, it got more difficult for many of them. And by the way, most people that live outside the city live there for a purpose, for a reason. Most people don't want to be inside the city. But it's amazing to me to, to, to understand what God's Word says here. Many offered to move within the city. But not only did they offer to move within, they obviously had enough offering to move within the city that they had to wait, oh, wait a minute, we can't have all of you come. One in ten of you will come. So that's what we see here. It says, And the rulers of the people dwelt in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in the city, and nine parts to dwell in other areas. So one out of ten were allowed to move inside. And apparently, I don't know the numbers, I don't know exactly how this looked on paper, but obviously the leadership that was there felt like if we had one out of ten people move in the city that were outside the city, that would be substantially strengthen us. But there were enough people that were willing to move inside that they had to wait, oh, wait a minute, not everybody can come. One out of ten can come. So this wouldn't necessarily be an easy move for those willing to come in. Many would have to take on new responsibilities like... Um, Protecting the walls that were in place now. They'd have to support the leadership and protect industry and business within the walls and continue to do city improvements. It was not a freebie just to move inside. They'd have to guard. They'd have to build. They'd have to protect. They'd have to prepare. It was not going to be easy. And then there's a whole, whole total mind shift. I used to live out there in the countryside. Now I'm living inside the city. Those are two drastically different lifestyles, right? Living out in the country versus living in the city is drastically different. Some of you wouldn't want to go to the city to save your life, right? And some of you who live in the city don't want to go to the countryside because you're scared of that. I mean, there's, there's, there's boogeyman out there in the dark. Um, but here's the interesting thing as I'm reading through all these names, and I won't take time to read through all the names. We don't have time, and it just I'll allow you to read that. But I want you to think about something. It says one, they cast lots. What's with casting lots? Wasn't that satanic? Isn't that demonic? Not necessarily. You see, how do you choose who's going to come in and who's not? How do you get to decide, well, he's got more money he does than he does, so I'll let him come, not him. Or this guy's bigger and stronger, and he'll be able to do more, so I'll let him come, not, her, not him. Or she's a better cook than she is, so I'll let her come in, but not her. How do you determine these things? They cast lots. You see, the casting, some thought casting lots was superstitious. Actually, it showed a willingness to accept from God whatever his, his will was. This is not the first and only place in Scripture. In fact, there are numerous places in Scripture where God allowed them to cast lots and God used what was decided upon through that process to fulfill His will. 
So they cast lots and accepted the outcome as from God. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33, it says this, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing there is, thereof is of the Lord. They looked at whatever the result of that casting of lots, whatever happened, whatever the outcome of that was, it's what the Lord allowed. Question, I've said this many times, I've used this as an illustration many times over the years, is God sovereign, yes or no? Can God do whatever he chooses to do, yes or no? He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't need our permission. He doesn't need to ask our advice. He can do whatever he wants. He's God. And since he's God, and is he all-powerful? And since he's God and he's all-powerful, could he not, with these last couple of storms, like Helena and what was the other one? Um, Milton. Could he not just went, and just had them go a different direction? He could have, right? He could have. He's that powerful. He's that strong. He could have directed it in a heartbeat if he wanted to. But sometimes he doesn't do that. But you have to understand, he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants that storm to come in, it's going to come in. You're not going to thwart it no matter what you do. If he wants you to go through that cancer, there's nothing you're going to do to stop it. If he wants your house to burn, it's going to burn. You say, well, is, God God, is God just a mean guy? No, I'm just saying he's sovereign. If he didn't want it, he could stop it. But what I am saying is this. He uses those circumstances to guide, to direct, to shape, and to mold our lives. And I've said it a million times. We pray for a life of ease. I want an easy life. I don't like infections. I don't like doctors. I don't like politics. I, I don't like all these things. I wouldn't choose them. Anybody else with me? Anybody like to choose difficult times? I, I don't. I like life of ease. I like sitting back and, re and then relaxing, right? But it's the difficulties. It's the trials. It's the hardships. It's the things that you and I would never choose that God allows and uses in our life to shape us, to mold us, to make us more like His Son. And when I think about this, something is so, as many people would say, is superstitious. God could direct that bottle of the point at anybody he wants. God could direct those, that casting of lots situation to, to land on somebody that you would have never chosen and then use it for his glory. And that's what in Proverbs 16, verse 33, it highlights very clearly. It says, the end of it is of the Lord. They were willing to say, I don't know how to make a choice, but I know who can. So hypothetically, we're going to spin the bottle, and whoever it lands on, that's who God must want. And we're going to accept it as such. Now, don't take me wrong. I don't know that they're spinning a bottle in Bible times. I'm just saying, you get the picture. But what I am saying is this. God uses unique circumstances and situations to direct the path that he wants us to take. In Numbers chapter 26 and verse 55 says, Notwithstanding, the land shall be divided by lot. According to the names of the tribes of their fathers, they shall inherit. According to the lot shall the possession thereof be divided between many and few. Well, that doesn't seem fair. I mean, I have the money. I can buy as much as I want. I have a family name. We've been in this land forever. Why can't I have it? Everybody's on an equal playing field when you spin the bottle. Once again, I'm not saying they spun a bottle, but you get the concept. Everybody's on equal foot. And the idea is that we're going to trust God in however it lands. So the idea is they were willing to trust God. Many people were willing to move in. But only one in ten got to. From the simple process of casting lots, Nehemiah names the new families that would join those already within the walls of Jerusalem. And we see that as we read through the middle of Nehemiah 11 through the end, there's a bazillion names. And these are the names of the families who are coming into the city. Many of them. Um, 
But there are also two name two main groups mentioned. Um, when you think about it, there, one was the tribe of Judah, which was very large, and then there was the tribe of Benjamin, which was rather small by nature. One tribe was extensively larger than the other. Yet they learned to work together. It wasn't the idea that, well, I come from a bigger platform. I come from a stronger platform. I come from a background that has more. So I'm worthy. No. Those that were from a huge tribe and those who were from the rather small tribe had equal footing as they came together into this city and they learned to work together. What was the result of these folks who were chosen? I, I find this u- unique as we go through this. There is equality. Everybody has equal footing. I'm not better than you because I'm from a bigger tribe. I'm not better than you because I come from this elite smaller tribe. Um, there was equal representation from the groups. There re- really was equal representation. There was authority and accountability dispersed and accepted. Uh, There were duties and responsibilities that were presented and accepted. There was a chain of command. Interestingly enough, if you and I were to choose who would be our leaders, we have a very distinct idea of what our leaders should look like. How many would agree? I mean, bless God, they need to be born-again believers in a perfect utopia, right? I mean, they need to be walking with Jesus every day before they're my leader. Okay, that sounds great on paper, but is it realistic in the world that we live in? No. We have this set of ideals that we want our leadership to possess. I find it interesting that Nehemiah didn't necessarily build his leadership from the priestly line. Well, if I was Nehemiah, I would have chosen only those who were walking with Jesus. I don't know that they were. I don't know that they weren't. But they weren't all of the priestly line. I've said this for years, and I hope you let this sink in a little bit. When you're voting for somebody, you're not voting on a pastor for your church. You'd like for them to have certain characteristics. But to think you're going to get a pastor, not going to happen. I remember a few years ago, we had probably two elections back, we had Mitt Romney. And I remember the talk amongst all the Christians. Well, he claims to be a Christian, but he's, a, he's actually a, what is he, Seventh-day Adventist? Mormon? He's a Mormon. Yeah, but you know what? He was a man of character at that time. He is a man who had deeply held to beliefs. He wasn't a liberal. He wasn't woke. He claims to be a Christian, and I just don't see it. Well, would you rather have him or what we had or got? I'm just saying, sometimes we have an expectation that is not realistic. And what sometimes we need to understand is that God is in control. Do you get that? God is in control. Well, what if they're what what, what if they do something wrong? Well, expect it. They're gonna do wrong. They're human. They're sinful. Like you, by the way. Like me. They're not always righteous and holy like you want. But I find it interesting that Nehemiah didn't just choose those who are of the priestly line to become leaders in the, in the city of Jerusalem. His leadership crossed boundaries. It crossed religious, economic, and other lines as they instilled the leadership. So I'm, as I'm reading through this chapter, I'm thinking, what is it that God wants us to draw from this? And I've racked my brain quite a bit, honestly. Lord, what is it that you want me to learn from this? 
And I think there are a couple takeaways, at least for me, that I think every one of us can learn from, actually. Our expectations need to be in the Lord, not on people. I don't know about you, but I have found that people let me down. God doesn't. Amen? When I think about everything that I'm doing in life, there's one constant that I can depend on. People, and even myself sometimes, with the best of intentions, let people down. You, with the best of intentions, say, I'll do this for you. I'll get this done for you. I'll go here for you. And all of a sudden, we fail. We forget. Something else came up. Time ran out. Whatever. We let people down. Maybe inadvertently, maybe by accident, but we do it. But the one person who never lets us down is God. And as I see through this, I know that God was in control. My expectation is in Him, not people. Number two, sometimes I'm forced to work with people that I wouldn't choose to work with. Anybody been in that situation before? Choosing, er, having, having to work with people that you would never choose to work with. That's huge. And it actually is a big part of your life. Because there are certain people that naturally, instinctively, I would avoid like the plague. They kind of have a different personality, kind of rubs me the wrong way. They have this attitude of arrogance or they're proud or whatever it may be. But, you know, left alone on a planet, on, on, you know, on a, on a deserted island, 100,000 miles from the nearest land, I'm like, you take that side, I'll take this side. There are people, Right? By nature, we're not best buds. But we have to learn to work with people. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples by our love for one another. And I know that God sometimes puts us in situations that we are forced to work with people that we would not choose to work with. Nehemiah 11. I, I hear this all the time, folks, and don't take this wrong if you're one that told me this. Pastor, I'm so excited about my new job. There's so many more Christians there. What do you want, utopia? Well, you want a perfect world where there's no unbelievers there? So that you can have a nice little work day with no dilemma? Trust me, if you had a whole company full of Christians, you're still going to have problems. Because everyone's still selfish, everyone's still sinful, and you're still going to have issues. But I've said for years, and guys know this because I keep reminding them, God gives you a job for two reasons. Number one, to provide for your family because God says who does not provide for his family is worse than an infidel. And the second reason God gives you a job is for what? A mission field. If you're working in an environment where they're all believers, what's your mission field? Because most of us outside of work don't lift a finger to reach the lost. I know I just stepped on some toes and made you angry, but it's true. Your workplace is to provide for your family and to have a mission field. To live out your faith. To be vocal about your faith. To encourage others in your faith. For you to share your story. That's why you have a job. And it's no less important than if you are a pastor, a missionary, evangelist. Your job is just as important, if not more so. You will reach people in your workplace that I will never meet or reach. You know people that I will never know. And unfortunately, most of my life is dealt, dealing with people inside. I have to force myself out to reach more people. That's why two days a week, I'm trying my best for over a year now to, reach, to get out where other people are. At least twice a week, I try to get outside these walls. I force myself to do it because why? If I don't force it, if I don't plan for it, it's a plan not to do it. But the reality is, we have to work at those things. And yet, we ask God, give me a work environment that's just easier. <laughs> Shame on us. You know what I said about moving to New York? And I'll tell you a quick story. I said I planted a church in Indiana by waving at people. I didn't know my neighbor, but I waved at him. When I come out of my house and he come out of his house, we both get in our car, I just wave at him. A few days later, I'm on my side of the fence. He's in a, he's in a yard two, two yards over. I just wave at him. 
did that over and over again. Before I even said a word, the guy shows up at church. He said, I Googled you. I found you out. You're a pastor. Shows up at church. Kid you not, this guy had hair halfway down his back, tattoos up and down his body. Which it was, I mean, he's just, he's just a cool guy. I mean, he's just up and tell you that. He started coming to church. Put his faith in Christ. And all of a sudden, one day, I get this tap on my shoulder. And I, one of the guys in my church says, hey, we've got a visitor in the back. You might want to go, re- go meet him. And I turn around and I'm like, Jeff? No, that's the, that's Jeff. That's my neighbor. He come walking in with new clothes. He had his hair all high, high and tight, and, you know, you know, military cut. I'm like, dude, what in the world, man? You cut your hair. He's like, yeah, I figured I was the only one here with hair halfway down my back. I thought I'd just do something new. And I just, you know, God got a hold of his life. I didn't say a word to him. Never would have. And you shouldn't either, by the way. Just my opinion. But God just did a work in his life, and I didn't have to tell him to change anything. I, didn't, I would never have told him that in, those con- in that context. God did a work in his life. But it's amazing to me. Your place of where you work is your mission field. You have to work at it. So you're going to be forced to work with people you would never choose to work with. And number three, they did what was good for the good of the whole, not what was good for themselves. How do we see that played out in politics today? Everyone, every man is out for himself. I find it amazing how someone can go into politics worth a half a million dollars, and 10 years later, they're worth $27 million. Boy, that's a good job. Wish I had it. Right? Let's, let's not pretend anymore, right? Every man goes for himself. This is what it is. Nehemiah established a leadership that worked for the good of the whole, not for the good of themselves. When you start applying these things to life, it's amazing what God can do. We're not through Nehemiah yet. We're almost there. We've got just a couple chapters left. But even in the list of names, we see that God appointed people to certain tasks to accomplish certain things for his glory. I don't know where God has you. But I know that according to 1 Corinthians, he says he places each one in the body as he sees fit. And in doing, even in the body of Christ, sometimes you're going to be asked to do things that, i got to do it with him. I gotta do that with her. Yep. You get to. But it's not for you, it's for the good of the whole. It's for God's glory, not your own. And the reality is, God's gonna work as he was here. God bless them as they work together. All I know is this. There is a work that God is wanting to do. You could look around and say, well, it's just coincidence that somebody took care of landscaping. It's just coincidence that we got a platform for a future pavilion. It's just coincidence. Or you can say God's in the process of doing some things. I choose to believe that God's in the process of doing some things. I know that God's at work. And as much as I love the physical things that are taking place, don't get me wrong, I appreciate it. And by the way, if you want to get involved in some financially helping some of those things, i got lots of ideas for you. Every pastor does. But as fun as that is, exciting as that may be, as cool as it is to see God working on behalf of people to do things, it's not near as exciting as when he does something spiritually in the heart of somebody. When God works in your heart, I'll be honest with you. I love seeing the newer folks getting excited about what God's doing. Two weeks ago, I preached on not losing the awe of what God has done in your life. Unfortunately, and I hate to say it, but some of you have, eh, that's old hat. I got saved so many years ago, I don't even care about it anymore. I, I can't comprehend that. 
Hey, Pastor, is there, yeah, the, yeah, there's people like that. It's like, get me excited, I dare you. I dare you to make me excited about something. Shame on us. We have forgot the awe that God, sinners in the hands of an angry God where he talks about being dangled over hell. And yet he pulls you away and puts you on solid ground. Psalm 40. And he brought me up out of a miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, established my goings, hath put a new song in my mouth, which some of you still haven't realized yet, and hath put a new song in my mouth, even praising unto God, that many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. And some of you come in like a bump on a pickle, and it's like, I dare you to excite me. I'm not going to excite you. If, you're not, if the Holy Spirit doesn't work in your life, that, 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 that's between you and God. But you're missing out. You're missing the blessing of being involved in what God is doing. I find it interesting that Nehemiah chose people I wouldn't choose. And yet they came together, worked together, and saw God blessed together. What does God have for you to do? What does God have for you? What, what attitude does he want you to have in working with others to accomplish his goals, not our own? But people came in. There was equality. There was equal representation. There was authority and accountability. There was accepted. There were duties and responsibilities given and dispersed and accepted. There were a host of things that were taking place simultaneously. And what was the end result? It was made stronger. It was able to be able to protect themselves against the enemy. And by the way, the stronger we are collectively, the stronger we will be against our enemies. We need each other. Folks, you don't even understand how much we need each other in this day and age that we live in. We need that. Amen? Amen. We need that. I don't know how God would speak to you today, but I do know this. He's on the throne. He's in charge. And my only job is to submit to him and whatever he wants to do in my life. Lord, work in our hearts this morning. I pray, God, that you would not only challenge us, but change us. And I pray, dear Father, Lord, that you would Lord, do the work that only you can do in our lives. Lord, in our flesh, in our weaknesses, Lord, we fail. But, Lord, we know that you are strong. And I pray, God, that we would not make excuses, but that we would simply submit to what your Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives, Lord. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I I don't know. The invitation is going to be quick and short. Simply this. Say, Pastor, God's challenged me in some areas this morning. By his grace, With the help of the Holy Spirit, there's some things I want to change. Some things I want to work on. Would you pray for me this morning? Anyone like that this morning? Yes, yes. And I'll say, Pastor, pray for me. Just uplifted hand. Not embarrass you, not call you out. Just simply say, I need prayer. Yes, yes. Anyone else? Can I challenge all of you who've lifted your hand? Right here where you're at, right here and now. Simply. Submit whatever it is that God challenged you. Submit it to Him. He'll do the work in you that is best, that is right, if you'll submit. Lord Jesus, you know our hearts. You know the very things that are dragging us down. You know the very things that distract us. You know the very things, Father, that hinder us from walking in complete obedience to you. And I pray, God, that you'd remove them, that you'd truly remove every distraction, every thing, Lord, that would take our focus off of walking completely faithful and obediently to you, Lord. And I pray, God, as we ask this question all around the room, many raise their hand, their heart towards you. I ask, God, that this week you give them victory. I ask your Father, Lord, that you would walk with them May they sense your presence. May you have, Lord, 
daily remind them and throughout the day remind them of their commitments to you. Lord, that we would see your hand at work and we submit to it. Ask, Father, for victory in this body of believers that your will be accomplished. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.